Chains, I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom he faithfully bore. He canceled my sin and he called me his friend. When death was arrested and my life began, oh, your grace. on a criminal's cross Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost If you're a Jesus follower you know that darkness did not reign Let's sing it out but then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me. Of all the redeemed, yes, we're free, free forever, amen. When death was arrested, my life began. Oh, we're free, free forever, we're free. Come join the song of all the redeemed, yes, we're free. And your life has begun when Jesus saved us from the cross, our Lord and Savior. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Good morning, church family. We are so well, we're so blessed to have you all with us today. And you know, God's grace and amazing love. Uh, we're still standing here and breathing alive, and we should be thankful about it. Amen. Psalm 100, verse 2 says, 
worship the Lord with gladness and come sing together with joy and that's what we're gonna be doing today worship him with the song every beat and I just hope and pray that every beat of your heart cries out for Jesus let's worship together Put those hands together. Sing it out his name, Jesus. Jesus, you're the only reason that I'm even breathing. I am wide awake. You move me, your freedom is consuming. I feel it rushing through me. I'll never be the same. Calling, every beat is calling out your name. Yes. Come on, let's lift up a little Hallelujah. praise. The prodigal is welcome home, the sinner now. 
now a saint But the God who died came back to life And everything has changed Hallelujah Christ is risen from the grave Hallelujah Christ is risen from the grave Oh death where is your sting Oh fear where is your power The mighty King of kings has risen Delivered and redeemed Eternal life is ours Oh praise his name forever Hallelujah Christ is risen from the grave from the grave and all throughout eternity our song will be the same Hallelujah Christ is risen from the grave Here's what we have to look forward to see your scars, your open arms, the beauty of your face. And through tears of joy, I'll lift my voice in everlasting praise. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, fear, where is your power? The from the grave Thank you, Jesus Sing it out And all throughout eternity Our song will be the same Hallelujah Christ is risen from the grave for your amazing grace, for saving us, redeem us, so we can be with you in heaven forever. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. We want to obey you, Lord, so help us. Forgive us for taking your grace for granted. Forgive our sin for what we say, what we did, what we thought that disobey you, Lord Jesus. Oh, Lord, help us to keep focus our hearts, our minds, just on you alone, Lord Jesus. We pray for those who are suffering right now, suffering in their sickness, finances, broken relationship. We're asking in Jesus' name, give them strength.
give them peace comfort them Lord so they may rest in your presence and trusting you that you are always good and you can do anything according to your will Lord when we are facing difficulties in our lives help us to see your faithfulness help us Lord and remind us for what you did on the cross you die on the cross, but you rose again. You have the victory, Lord Jesus. You are greater than anything, and nothing is impossible for you. And you never leave us alone. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for everything. In the name of Jesus, whom we love with our hearts, we pray. Amen. When peace like a river attendeth my way when sorrows like sea billows roll whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say it is well it is well
bless the Lord. Thank you. Uh, you know, Edward and Anne Marie have shared their testimonies, and their testimonies are in the sermon today, and we didn't coordinate that. So I'm going to take that as the Holy Spirit at work. Amen. Amen. Uh, and, and the fact that lives are transformed and changed, and people step up and they say, I now believe in Jesus and I want to be baptized. That is, I'm so thankful that, that we're watching God at work. Uh, all through our days. A number of you have uh, asked me about mom, and I'm very pleased to give you an update that she came home this week. And, uh, yeah, I'm in. And uh, so um, well, she's, uh, she's taking some of uh, the medications at home, but she's making progress, and it appears that the uh, uh, infection is disappearing. So thank you for uh, your prayers. Uh, I think I'm a little t exhausted, uh, this whole thing, but uh, I'm thankful that the Lord is carrying us through. Let's pray, shall we? Lord, we are so thankful for how faithful you have been to our church family all these 60 plus years to guide, provide, and protect. Uh, Lord, we need you every moment of every day. And uh, Lord, as we turn our attention now to your word, uh, we ask you to change the way we think, speak, and act as your word and your spirit is at work within us, changing us more and more into the image of Christ. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I'm going to invite you to turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 28. Genesis chapter 28. And we've been studying this fascinating book of beginnings. So if you'd like to catch up on the sermon series, the uh, earlier sermons are available on our website at highlands.us. Moses is the author, uh, writing after the exodus from Egypt. Genesis tells us that God created everything that exists and he rules over it all. It tells us of humanity's tragic fall into sin and death and God's unfolding plan of redemption beginning in chapter 3 with Adam and Eve and continuing through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who we call the patriarchs because they are the founding fathers of the Hebrew nation. We studied the life of Abraham and found out that he really is one of the most important characters not only in the Bible but in world history as well, because he's the father of many nations. And what the Bible tells us is that God called this man and his wife to leave their, their family and their nation and go to a new land so that he could give mankind a new beginning. God revealed a plan to redeem creation beginning with Abraham, who had become the model recipient of saving grace through faith. Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. He also become the founding father of the nation that distinctly would bear the honor of bringing into the world the promised Savior, the Messiah, who would call people from every land, every nation, to be reconciled with their Creator. <clears throat> well, as we've read through Genesis, we find that Abraham lived and he died, but the covenant did not die with him. It was passed from generation to generation through a specific chosen lineage of Abraham's descendants. Isaac was chosen by God to carry the covenant forward, and then Jacob was. And our focus today is on the life of Jacob. Now, you may recall when we gathered together last uh, in chapter 27 that we observed that Jacob said something as he was deceiving his father. Uh, and he said, the Lord your God gave me success. And we underscored the significance of that word your what he was saying is, this is not my God, this is not our God, this is your God, Dad. And he was disassociating himself with God. But there is an event that happens in this chapter that we're studying today that is transformative for him. Because in this chapter he says, the Lord will be my God. My God. So what event was it that was so transformative for Jacob? And the answer is that Jacob met God. Jacob met God. And when a person meets God, their life is necessarily transformed. A person cannot remain the same. A person's character and their goals and their values and their trajectory, trajectory gets changed. 
Now, many people would come up to me after services on Sunday and said, Pastor, I didn't know that there was that much in Genesis about what we read about in the New Testament. And, and really, the, the Old Testament and the New Testament are, are very much dependent upon each other. The, the book of Genesis explains the beginnings of everything, the foundations of everything, so that when we read the New Testament, we go, oh, I can connect those dots. I understand what's taking place here. And so... Uh, the events that are, are, are referenced in this chapter are uh, also referenced by Jesus when he was choosing his disciples. And the story is told us, uh, for us in John's Gospel, chapter 1. It reads, The next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee. And he found Philip and said to him, Come, follow me. Philip was from Bethsaida, Andrew and Peter's hometown. Philip went to look for Nathanael and told him, We found the very person Moses and the prophets wrote about. His name is Jesus, the son of Joseph. From Nazareth. Nazareth, exclaimed Nathanael, can anything good come from Nazareth? Well, come and see for yourself, Philip replied. As they approached, Jesus said, Now here is a genuine son of Israel, a man of complete integrity. How do you know about me? Nathanael asked. Jesus replied, I could see you under the fig tree before Philip found you. Then Nathanael exclaimed, Rabbi, you are the son of God, the king of Israel. Jesus asked him, do you believe this just because I told you I'd seen you under the fig tree? You'll see greater things than this. Then he said, I tell you the truth. You will all see heaven open and the angels of God going up and down on the Son of Man, the one who is the stairway between heaven and earth. New Living Translation. So Jesus here clearly applies this image of the heavenly stairway to himself. And so he was saying that he is the ladder, he is the bridge that came from heaven uh, to earth, the only bridge by which it is possible for men and women to pass from earth to heaven. And so as we're reading this chapter today, we should keep in mind Jesus. And the real question is this, do you know Jesus? Do you know the one who is the bridge, the ladder? You know, do you, do you, you might be lonely, like we're going to find that Jacob was. You, you might be impoverished. You might be unemployed. You might be disgraced. You might be honored. You might dishonor. You might, be, you might be fearful. But whatever you might be, look to Jesus. Because he's the ever-present companion for those who are lonely. He is the eternal wealth for those who are poor. He is the glory of those who are dishonored and despised. And he is the rock and fortress for the one who is afraid. He is God. He is the God who makes promises. We, like Jacob, are unworthy to receive. And he always keeps his promises. Now, one of the things that's accomplished here by sharing this story is seeing it unfold in fulfillment of God's promises in the chapters to come. The Lord said, I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. And these are the words that become the theme that governs the course of subsequent events. So when Jacob returned from Laban's house, after many years he came back to this very same place, which we know as Bethel, where God again blessed him and, and renewed the covenant promises. Uh, Jacob here, it tells us in this story, is going to, is going to create a pillar a monument, a, a memory. And when he comes back to this place in chapter 35, he's going to place another pillar, another monument. And the purpose of these monuments are to remind the reader that God kept his promises through all of those chapters in between. Now, the chapter of our focus today is chapter 28, but there's some things I want to read before chapter 28 that will help us better understand uh, the story that's unfolding in chapter 28. So I'm going to point you in your Bibles back to chapter 26 and the last two verses of chapter 26. It reads, When Esau was 40 years old, he married Judith, daughter of Ber the Hittite, and also Basemath, daughter of Elan the Hittite. They were a source of grief to Isaac and Rebekah. So even though we found that Isaac was now at peace with his neighbors, there was war going in on inside of the household because Esau had married two godless wives who brought great grief. And later he adds another one to the mix. And his choice of wives describes his choice of lifestyle. 
And you remember that the author of Hebrews warns us not to follow Esau's example, the example of godless Esau. You see, Esau was godless because he did not value having a relationship with God. And his life choices reflected this. There's some insights in these two verses that are given to us about, uh, about Esau's path and choices. It, first off, it appears that he arranged these marriages himself without any input from mom and dad. And then he chose women who were part of the local and godless um, uh, culture. And no doubt that he knew how important it was to have a godly wife. He knew the story about how grandpa had sent his favorite servant to go and find a godly wife for his dad, Isaac. Uh, but evidently, his Esau's appetites were, they, they, they didn't prioritize having a godly wife or a family that desired a relationship with God. His appetites were elsewhere. And then let's start our study of chapter 28 at verse 41 in chapter 27, where it reads, Esau held a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing his father had given him. Remember, the early part of the chapter talks about how the blessing was stolen. And he said to himself, the days of mourning for my father are near. My dad is about to die. And then I will kill my brother Jacob. When Rebekah was told what her older son Esau had said, she sent for her younger son Jacob and said to him, Your brother Esau is consoling himself with the thought of killing you. Now then, my son, do what I say. Flee at once to my brother Laban in Haran. Stay with him for a while until your brother's fury subsides. And when your brother is no longer angry with you and forgets what you did to him, I'll send word for you to come back from there. Why should I lose both of you? in one day. And so Esau had begged for a blessing and his father gave him a blessing. But really, when he figured out what was the blessing was about, it was really an anti-blessing because the best blessing had been stolen from him. And so there's this murderous hatred that fills the soul of Esau. And so he is biding his time and can't wait for dad to die so that once dad dies, he's going to take the pleasure of killing his brother with his own hands. His hatred was so deep that he thought of that, and it brought comfort to him, knowing someday I'm going to get my brother. I'm going to get even. Now, evidently, he was not a man who kept his thoughts private, because he told someone who told Rebecca. And Re Rebecca didn't miss anything, and she did not for a moment doubt that Esau would one day erupt and fulfill his homicidal intent. And her question, why should I be deprived of you in, in, in one day, means it implies that she knows that it's going to happen. And that there's going to be someone who avenges Jacob's death by killing Esau, maybe God himself, and she's going to lose both of her sons. And as long as the two of them are together in camp, as long as Jacob's in camp, then Esau is going to be reminded every day when he sees him of what was done. And that reminder was going to continue to fuel that fire of hatred. So he knew that the brothers, she knew that the brothers needed to be separated in order to give an opportunity for Esau's hatred to decrease. She was a very swift thinker, and she realized the best solution might be to send Jacob to live with her brother Laban. But the question then became, how do we get that to happen? How am I going to convince Isaac, dad, uh, to, 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 to make this happen? And so what she does is she plays on Isaac's fears that Jacob might marry a local godless woman. So she, what she wanted to accomplish was good, protecting her son and her sons. But how she went about it was deceptive and therefore wrong. Now, Rebecca thought that this was just going to be for a short period of time, a little while, as it's translated in some translations. But uh, the days, that day of summons never came. Uh, Jacob was absent from the home for over two decades, and Rebecca died sometime in, in the meanwhile. Now, her death is not recorded for us in Genesis, but there is no recorded subsequent meeting to this. She never had an opportunity to be with her son Again, there's only one more time when she is mentioned in Genesis, and that's in chapter 49, where it reads that she was buried in the cave of Machpelah near Mamre. 
Then Rebekah said to Isaac, I'm disgusted with living because of these Hittite women. And if Jacob takes a wife from among the women of this land, from Hittite women like these, my life will not be worth living. So Isaac called for Jacob and blessed him and commanded him, Do not marry a Canaanite woman. Go at once to Padan Aram, to the house of your mother's father, Bethuel, and take a wife from yourself there from among the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and increase your numbers until you become a community of peoples. May he give you and your descendants the blessing given to Abraham so that you may take possession of the land where you now live as an alien, the land God gave to Abraham. Then Isaac sent Jacob on his way, and he went to Padan Aram, to Laban, son of Bethuel the Aramean, the brother of Rebekah, who is the mother of Jacob and Esau. And so what it tells us is that Isaac calls Jacob to tell him of their decision. And no doubt when that summons came, Jacob might have been expecting his father to scold him for what he had done in stealing his brother's blessing. But Isaac didn't do that. See, God had shaken him to his foundations. and Now he has decided that he is going to please God. Now, the wording of this blessing shows that Isaac had come to value the covenant of salvation and the sovereignty of God in the manner in which it was unfolded. And he knows that God's plans are better than this, than his. And and so not only did Isaac speak kindly to his son, but also gave him an extra blessing as he set out on the journey to Haran. And his blessing officially recognized Jacob as the third patriarch. Now, as has been the case in a number of these narratives in Genesis, and will continue to be, the blessing of uh, uh, Isaac upon Jacob uh, forespoke the events that would happen in subsequent chapters. Uh, Jacob would visit Laban for a while. Esau's anger would subside. And Jacob would find a wife and return with a great assembly of people. And then the story shifts attention to Esau. Now Esau learned that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him to Padan Aram to take a wife from there. And that when he blessed him, he commanded him, do not marry a Canaanite woman. And that Jacob had obeyed his father and mother and gone to Padan Aram. Esau then realized, then, note the word then, he then realized how displeasing the Canaanite women were to his father Isaac. How come it took him this long to figure that out? That tells you something about his sensitivities. Esau then realized how displeasing the Canaanite women were to his father Isaac. So he went to Ishmael and married Mahalath, the sister of Neboeth, the daughter of Ishmael, son of Abraham, in addition to the wives he already had. So evidently, as a result of discovering, finally, his uh, parents' dislike of the Canaanite women, he decides he's going to try to improve that relationship by marrying one of the cousins. Remember that back in this time, uh, it was different than the times we now live in. Abraham married his half-sister. That was okay. Uh, Another generation married their first cousin. And it wasn't until uh, the time of Moses where these kinds of practices Uh, were uh, against the law. And that's because as generations succeeded, the lifespans got short because the DNA was affected by the sin sin of the people. And so uh, it was not uncommon for uh, the early generations to marry their half-sisters and cousins. And so he's thinking, well, you know, obviously uh, Jacob is looking for a wife among Uncle Laban's children. So why don't I look for a wife among Uncle Ishmael's children. Maybe then I will get some kind of a blessing and gain favor from my father. But of course, the result of that only added irritation in the home because Esau was unspiritual and and he could not connect these spiritual dots. He could not understand the picture. He could not understand that imitating Jacob's marriage was not going to get his dad's blessing or God's blessing. He had no idea of what it was to please God. Verse 10, Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. And when he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. 
Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and laid down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. So we find that Jacob now has set out on this journey, some 500 or more miles long. He is evidently very much alone. He is fleeing from an angry, murderous brother. He is facing an uncertain future, and he is depending upon his father's blessing. Even though he had been, as described, a young man that, that hung around the camp, he is now having to learn how to be a pilgrim and walk by faith. Now, several days' journey from where he had been to this place, what we know as Bethel, and no doubt during those days of travel as he was walking the paths, the, putting one foot in front of the other, his mind must have been filled with all kinds of questions. Questions like, would Esau be following and try to kill him? Uh, would he have enough food and water to continue and, and keep on going? How was he going to be received by his uncle Laban since he wasn't able to bring a great caravan and, of gifts? Would he ever see his mother again? Would he ever see his father again? Would he ever be able to come home? Had all the things that he had done in order to get the blessing been worthwhile? All kinds of questions must have been going through his mind. And he's profoundly alone. He's got no one to talk to. And he's in the middle of a wasteland that is filled with clear and present danger. And finally, at the end of one of these days of travel, he's despondent and exhausted, and he finds a stone for a pillow and lays down to sleep. And by the way, in chapter 12, we read that Abraham had been in that place, Bethel, and had built an altar there, but we're not told if Jacob knew that or not. So Jacob's leapt on the earth and used a stone for a headpiece, which was not an uncommon practice in the Near East. And while he was sleeping, he saw this ladder or stairway and angels going up and down it. Now, the word here that's translated stairway or ladder uh, is a word that only occurs once in the Bible. And because of that, some of the translators didn't know quite how to render it. The King James, which is centuries old, renders it ladder, but ladder doesn't seem to be an adequate descriptive to describe a place where angels can simultaneously be going up and coming down at the same time. So perhaps the word meant more of a grand staircase, uh, a kind of a picture. But unlike Babel's Tower, this staircase is not a, uh, a product of human delusions of grandeur. It is the way by which God makes himself known to Jacob. And remember that Jesus has called himself that ladder, that stairway. And it's Jesus who is the way by which God makes himself known to us. Now, there's angels going up and down this structure, and not many people have seen angels. There are a few that are clearly identified in the Bible. There's Elisha's servant in Dothan, and Daniel, and Zechariah, and of course, Mary and Joseph, and uh, the women who were at the tomb of Christ, as well as those who saw uh, Christ depart into heaven the Apostle Paul, and the Apostle John. But what this scene really portrays dramatically is how close heaven and earth are and how much interest there is from heaven uh, to earth. The Bible says there are thousands and thousands of angels, meaning they are too numerous to be counted, and that they are ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit it in a salvation. So Jacob has discovered in the middle of no place that he is not alone, that God is with him, that the God of his grandfather and his father are watching over him, and there are angels present to serve and protect him. And as he's looking up the stairway, his attention is drawn to the Lord. There above it stood the Lord. And he said, I am the Lord the God of your father Abraham, and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, 
and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. So like Abraham in chapter 15, this covenant was confirmed while they were asleep. Abraham received it in a vision and Jacob received it in a dream. In both of these narratives, the, the, the same covenant is described. Now thus far in the story, the emphasis has been put on Jacob getting the blessing here the emphasis shifts to him being the blessing. In fact, this is the fifth time uh, in Genesis that refers to the patriarchs uh, as a means of worldwide blessing. We today are blessed because Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were blessed. Now, some have observed that in this case, the uh, promise might be even more dramatic because when Abraham received the blessing, uh, he was married but childless. But here, uh, Jacob is not even married yet, let alone childless. It's interesting to note that when God appears to Abraham and Isaac, there's never a reaction of shock or fear or terror. It's as though these appearances of God, these theophanies, as the theologians call them, are taken in stride, just part of life. But here we read that Jacob responded in fear. So what's that all about? Well, well perhaps that fear is likened to the kind of fear that Adam experienced in Genesis chapter 3, after he was disobedient to the Lord. You remember that when he heard the Lord in the garden, he was afraid. He had sinned, he was afraid. Jacob knew he had sinned against God, against his brother, against his father, and when God shows up, he is afraid. It is sin that will invariably make us afraid of God. It is sin that causes separation between us and God. That's why it's so important that when we do sin, that we get that matter resolved as swiftly as possible. You know, in neither of the cases I mentioned did God issue a word of rebuke. Instead, he spoke blessings of promise and assurance to Jacob. And this is appearance is uh, the first of more than a half a dozen revelations of God that Jacob is going to receive in his lifetime. And the same God who had protected and cared for his father and grandfather now pledged to care for him and give him the land that he was lying on and multiply his descendants and make them a blessing to the world. And then the Lord goes on to explain the significance of the latter. He says, Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will never leave you until I have done what I have promised you. So the presence of God between that the, the directs activity between heaven and earth promised that he would never leave uh, Jacob, that Jacob could never go any place where God wasn't already there. And the latter would go with him. It didn't matter if he traveled hundreds of miles away to Mesopotamia and, and stay there for 20 years. The, the, God was going to be with him. The ladder was going to be with him. The angels were going to be with him. It was never going to be left or forsaken. And this is a real revelation about the nature of God that was not common for the people of that era. Because the people of that era thought that when you left home, you left your God behind. Because a God was the God of that temple, or the God of that hill, or the God of that city, or the God of that river. This God is not limited to a temple or a city or a river or a hill because this is the real God. And there's a phrase in here, until I have done what I promised you, and that should not be interpreted to mean that the Lord's going to leave him after he's done. 
fulfilling the promises. That's not the intended meaning of the phrase. He's saying, I will not leave you. I will do everything I have promised to do. And you know, the promise of God being with his people and, and faithful to his people is repeated oftentimes in scripture. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse five, we read, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For you have said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be content with your money because God's taking care of you. It's not your money that's taking care of you. God's not going to leave us nor forsake us. And, and all of this blessing was made possible because of God's grace. Because Jacob didn't deserve any grace. He was a thief. He was running and he was alone because of his sin. He didn't merit anything good from God. But in, this, in the depths of his misery, God met him with grace. In the depths of our misery, God meets us with grace. Notice that Jacob was not seeking God. He was running away from the consequences of his actions. And he wasn't expecting grace, but it was poured out upon him without measure. That's the way God treats us also. It was grace that had brought Jacob thus far, and grace would lead him home. Amazing grace. Amazing grace. So God would appear to Jacob more times, but this first meeting is a significant one because now he learns that God is interested in him, him, and watching over him. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, ah, surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? There's none other than the house. Th 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 this is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called that place Bethel, though the city used to be called Luz. How awesome he translates literally to be, uh, to be feared. And so he realizes he's in the presence of God and that brings fear. And that is actually a correct response because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Proverbs chapter 1. And he discovered that in the most unlikely of places in the middle of desolation that God is here. This, even this place is God's house. And that's why he calls it Bethel. And the word Bethel means the house of God. And he talks about the gate of heaven. This is the first time where he's seen this ladder and he's still kind of figuring things out. And so he figures that this place must be the gate of heaven. This is the entrance to heaven. And so his next act was to worship the God who had appeared to him. And so he takes his pillow, that rock, and turns it into a pillar to memorialize this place and this event. And the pouring of the oil on the stone was to consecrate that stone or set that stone apart as something distinct, as a stone, stone set apart for God. He didn't use the stone as a, an altar or a place of sacrifice. He simply set it up as a memorial. And uh, in the days of the patriarchs and Moses, this was a common practice. Uh, these would be set up to remember an, an event where God performed a miracle or where God revealed himself, or it might establish a boundary where there was a, a treaty that was, uh, was come to, or it might be the monument of a loved one who had passed away. Later on, this practice became uh, unbiblical. And the reason for that appears to be that eventually people started looking at these not as symbols and reminders and rather turned them into idols. And of course, idolatry is something none of us should be involved in. Verse 20, then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I am taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's house, then the Lord will be my God. And this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. Now, Genesis is filled with first mentions, and this is the first mention 
of a vow. This is the first vow that is recorded in the Bible. And a vow is a solemn promise to provide God some service in exchange for some gift that he is granting. And so like many first mentions in the scripture, it, it behooves us to look at it in greater detail. Like, for instance, ask questions. Was this a, was this a good vow or was this a, a bad vow, a vow? Was it a wise vow or was it a foolish vow? And, and what about vows in general? Are they good? Uh, are they things that we're supposed to do? Or uh, are they instead, uh, do they arise from the sinful nature of men and women who think they're in some kind of a position where they can negotiate with God? These are questions that we ask when we come across first mentions. And in the Old Testament, there, there's apparently some good vows, be, like, for instance, Hannah's promise to give her firstborn, Samuel, to God if he would grant her children. There are instructions we find about giving vows, uh, like, for instance, the Nazarite vows. And the instructions makes, they, it makes it very clear we need to be very careful about the vows that we make and that we're very careful to fulfill those vows. Since a vow is a solemn promise to do something uh, or, or something, then it has a great dependency upon our ability to fulfill what we promised. And oftentimes we think we can accomplish things we cannot accomplish. And so we who live in a time of grace should be very careful about making any vows, because if we do make a vow, we are responsible for fulfilling that vow. But remember that Jacob did not live in our era. He didn't have the word of God that we have to provide instruction. In fact, he didn't even have the Old Testament. It hadn't been written yet. It wouldn't be written for another 400 years uh, later by Moses. So he, he had a, a, a different paradigm in which he was working than we do. And so some of the commentators, the, the Bible scholars, they differ greatly over the, was this a good thing or was it not a good thing that he did? Uh, some of the scholars indicate that since this was his conversion experience, this was the beginning of his personal relationship with God, that it was appropriate for him to make this vow as a response to God's promise. And, you know, when you think about it, when we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord, we are, in effect, making a vow. We are vowing that He is our Lord and He is our Savior and we are His. But because this vow contains some if-then kind of statements, if you do this, I'll do this, there are other Bible scholars who look at it and say, no, this was just a, <laughs> Jacob's way to try to manipulate God. And so they, they have various perspectives on it. But regardless, Jacob's response shows that Jacob knew what... God has as a purpose for revealing himself to men and women. And that, and that is that when he does this, a life must be altered and, uh, and changed in a, to be acceptable to him. Now, Jacob's condition for the vow included that God was with him, as promised. God had already promised it through this long and difficult journey and providing food and clothes and returning to his home in peace. And then he would dedicate himself to God and the stone would become a place of worship, and Jacob would give a tithe, or a tenth, of all that God gave him. Now, have you noticed how all up until that last part of his vow, it, he speaks of God in a third person. He speaks of he and him and so forth. But then when he gets to this matter of the tithe, he addresses God directly as you. Of everything you give to me. A tenth I will give to you. There is nothing more personal than our tithe. It is, it's, it's evident here that uh, Jacob is now serious about his relationship with God because he commits himself to tithing. Here also is a, a, a recognition uh, of the awareness of the source of his provisions, of everything you give me. Everything comes from God. Everything that's good comes from God. Now, there are some people today who mistakenly believe that tithing was instituted under Moses and the law. And since believers are not under the law, but rather under grace, then tithing doesn't apply. But what we have learned is that the tithe predated Moses by 400 years. 
Moses codified or uh, uh, clarified tithing, but actually it was 400 years earlier with Abraham in Genesis chapter 14 that Abraham, who is the father of faith and the father of the faithful, that's us, instituted a tithe, initiated a, a tithe. And so we now know that the tithe was not instituted under the law, it was just clarified. But then there brings up a question, well, you know, is, does the New Testament say anything about a tithe? And the answer is, yes, it does. In fact, not, not Jesus himself talks about the tithe. In Matthew 23, 23, Jesus said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you tithe, there's the word, you tithe mint and dill and cumin, small stuff, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law. And so that we all understand what the weightier matters of the law are, he tells us what they are. They are justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. What does he say, say about the tithe? These you ought to have done. These you ought to have done. Jesus never disavowed tithing. Jesus here was condemning the scribes and Pharisees, not because they were tithing, but rather because they were neglecting the weightier matters of the law. Now we know that Jacob did not have an easy life in the years that followed. We're going to read in the chapters to come. We know that God forgave his sins and was with him, but he also suffered the consequences of his sins. He had deceived uh, uh, Isaac. And in return, his father-in-law, Laban, deceives him. And the story is quite, quite a story. We know that um, Jacob used a kid to deceive his father. And years later, Jacob's sons used a kid to deceive their father when they told him the lie that Joseph had been killed by a wild animal. But the thing that kept him going all through the difficult time was this promise of God to never leave him nor forsake him, to always be with him. He depended on this. So God in his grace forgives us, but in his righteousness oftentimes sees to it that we reap what we sow. Being a believer doesn't exempt us from the laws of God's righteousness and impartial dealings. And sometimes even those who are his, of his household receive a greater discipline. As for Rebecca, you know, the cost of sin is always greater than it first appears. Uh, the thing that she feared most came about. She feared that she would lose both her sons, and that's exactly what happened. Uh, Jacob moved a far off place and was gone 20 years, and there's no record that she ever had the chance to see him again. And we, as we continue reading, we find it wasn't very long hereafter that Esau, the other son, went to live in the hill country of the Seir or Edom. As with regards to Jacob, we know that God had promised to be with him and continued to be with him. And there were places he went that he ought not go. And the same is true with us as well. That God has promised to be with us and is watching over us both when we're inside of his will and when we're outside of his will as well. And it's God's grace like that that should turn us away from sin and help keep us on the right path. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, Surely I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. 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 I'm going to invite you to take your communion elements You know, some people have heard about Jesus and they think that he was a great teacher, and, and he was. But don't realize that there's something very special about Jesus. That Jesus was God incarnate, meaning in the flesh. Something very, very special about Jesus. In fact, we find this description of Jesus in Colossians chapter 1. It reads, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by Him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, 
visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. And in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death, in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. We're all sinners. We've all sinned. How can we stand in the presence of a holy God? We can stand in the presence of a holy God presented as holy and blameless and above reproach because of what Christ has done for us. He took our sin, and because sin requires death, he died on Calvary's cross and paid for our sins so that we could have the privilege of coming into the presence of Almighty God. The night before he went to Calvary, he gathered with his disciples for what we call the Last Supper. They didn't know it at the time. And he instructed his disciples to continue partaking of these sacred elements in remembrance. And by us doing it, we are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. Not just the fact of the Lord's death, but the reason for the Lord's death to save us from our sin. And so I invite you to partake with me in the elements, proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. Thank you, Lord, for loving us so incredibly much, saving us from our sin at a great price, adopting us as your children, preparing a place where there's no more death or disease, a place where we will enjoy you and each other for all eternity and giving us the assignment while we still are here to go and make disciples, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for revealing yourself to us and drawing us into relationship with you for your many promises and that great promise that you will never leave us nor forsake us. As those who were baptized today professed in their testimonies, you were always faithful, always faithful, always faithful. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you.